Yeah. Um, we looked last night at uh, four fields, um, and so today we're going to kind of dive into some different tools we can use to reach uh, each of those categories. Uh, and I'll be starting with the first field that we talked about, uh, which, is, which is to go. Uh, so when we're entering into a place, uh, what do we do? How do we find people that we really want to be gospeling with, growing, and uh, gathering with? Uh, and so the first thing that we're going to talk about today uh, is a person of peace. Person of peace. We're going to be looking in John chapter 4. Um, and instead of reading the whole thing, because um, that would take a little while, I'm going to summarize kind of the story. It should be pretty familiar to some of us in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really good story. If you haven't read it before and this is new to you, please take some time to read it today or in the coming days. Uh, it's a really uh, great story. Um, but in, in John chapter 4, Jesus enters into a village in Samaria uh, in, in verse 40. Uh, is at a well, his disciples leave him, and he's well by himself in the middle of the day. A woman comes up to gather water, and Jesus starts talking to her. And he starts to ask her questions about her life and uh, what she's doing. She's there to grab water, and he asks for something. And uh, she, he, he offers her living water. And uh, she, gets, she says to him, like, well, what is this living water that I can have it? So I want to come back to this well. And she just tells her that he's this living water, and he's here to offer it to her. Um, and she recognizes as Jesus is telling her these things. Jesus even is able to tell her things about her life that uh, he shouldn't know. Um, and so he points out to her. Uh, you know, he asks her, do you have a husband? And she goes, no. And, and he knows who she is and what her story is. And so he says, I, I know that you don't have a husband. The man you're with now is not your husband. And uh, you've had five before. And so when she realizes that Jesus knows this about her, she realizes that he's a great prophet. And so she says, uh, like, she recognizes that. Um, and she tells him that she's waiting um, for the coming Messiah. Um, that, her, that Jacob, who the land she's living on, Jacob had promised was going to come. And she's waiting for this Messiah. And Jesus reveals this woman that, that he is the Messiah. Uh, and so Jesus' disciples come back around the end of this conversation, and, and she goes out in the village. Uh, and in verse 28, uh, we see what she does with what Jesus has shared with her. She says, uh, says, The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And then they went out of the city and came to him. Um, so this woman, she goes and she goes back into her town and she shares with them what she, this experience she's had with Christ and she invites them to come and see it. And what's really cool about that, um, if you start reading a little bit further, Jesus kind of takes some time to share with his disciples about the harvest. But we kind of pick up with the woman's story in verse 39. And so the Samaritans, they get there and it says to Christ and they say, it says in 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified he told me all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. And then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so this woman, she goes and has this interaction, this experience with Jesus, and it changes her in such a way that she wants to share it with others. And so she goes into her own village to her own friends and neighbors, and she shares what she's experienced. And she invites them to to join her um, in learning from Christ. And so they go and they, they see Christ because this woman was faithful to share and invite them to have an, an interaction, have an experience with Christ. And these, these people in her village come to the Lord uh, because she was faithful to go out and, and reach them. And so we see this woman, I think we see a pretty great example of the kind of person we want to be when it comes to what should be our heart for going out into these fields. And so we're talking about person of peace. We're going to talk a little bit later about how to find persons of peace. But right now we're going to talk about what person of peace is. Um, and so a lot of times we, we might get into our heads. Uh, we want to be a person of peace. It's like, well, i got to have this ability or I need to have this amount of time and training to do so. I've got to be this far ahead in my faith. I've got to have all these things worked out. Um, but if we look at the story of the Samaritan woman, she didn't have anything worked out uh, immediately, right? She, the only thing she had was that she had experienced something great in Christ. She believed on his words, that he really was who he said he was, and it changed something for her. And so if we're going to look at her. Y'all know who Frank, or not Frank, Billy Graham is, right? Mm -hmm. All right, that's good. We're not too far away from the Billy Graham uh, group. Maybe in a generation or two, that won't make as much sense. But Billy Graham, right? So if we were to compare Billy Graham I 
feel like I should write his whole name. Right, Billy G seems kind of a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just call her woman because we didn't get a name. But I'm sure she had a nice name. So Billy Graham versus the woman. Uh, Billy Graham had a his experience. How, how experienced was Billy Graham? Very Yeah, he was highly experienced, right? He's been he'd been Billy Graham by the time, by the end of his life had been doing this kind of thing for years, right? What about this woman? How much experience that she had before she went to her village? None. None. She didn't even go through a uh, DMI. But <laughs> she had received the good news and she wanted to share with others. And she knew what that good news was, and so she was able to share it. So Billy Graham, highly experienced woman. None. Not, nothing at all. What about education? Uh, how, how educated was Billy Graham? Very educated. Very educated, right? He spent years of his life studying the word. Uh, he was a great uh, theologian, great preacher. Yeah, highly educated. What about the Samaritan woman? Probably not a lot. We don't know a lot about her background, um, but it was likely she didn't have, she certainly probably didn't have the training that Billy Graham did uh, as far as education. Um, so, yeah, so Billy Graham, education. High education. Highly educated. And her, not at all. What about reputation? Billy Graham's reputation. How was Billy Graham's reputation? Really good reputation. Uh, a story that often gets passed around in our, our circles we're talking about this is uh, Billy Graham so much so wanted to be above reproach that even when he would go to hotels during conferences, he would make sure to rent a room on a floor with, with no women on it um, so that there would be no, not even a hint of anybody being able to suggest that he had been up to anything um, unfaithful or inappropriate. And so, yeah, highly, uh, as far as his reputation, reputation starts with an R, not with an A. <laughs> All right, reputation, we'll say above reproach. What about the Samaritan woman? Bad. Bad. Pretty bad, right? I mean, this woman, she's there at the well in the middle of the day by herself. That is not the time that you would go to get water, right? Most of the women would go out there in the morning, and she's here in the middle of the day, in the middle of the heat of the day, covering water. So not only should you have a bad reputation in her private life, but it seems like the village was even aware of that. I mean, probably likely you would be aware of that if a woman in your village had had five husbands. Um, so she had a, a poor reputation. Now, it would be great to be able to go out with that experience, your education, reputation, right? Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't want to have those things, but if we look at this woman, she didn't have any of those things, and yet God was able to use her. Um, and so oftentimes when we are going out in the harvest and we want to get started, one of the things that holds us back is we don't recognize um, how God wants to use us and when God wants to use us. If we think we need to be Billy Graham in order to go out, many of us will never even start. But this Samaritan woman, all she had was that she had received the good news um, and that she uh, loved what Jesus had told her and loved what she experienced so much that she was willing to go and share it with others. And so this woman, even though she had no education, or not much education, not much experience, no experience, at least in sharing the gospel at all, um, and, and a poor reputation, she was able to go out to a, a community of people who knew her, um, and knew her story, and share what Christ had done, um, and had affected great change. And so, before we look at this, um, we really see there are three things in this woman's life that uh, equipped her to be a good person of peace, and three things that we should strive for, and look for in others when we're looking for people who we want to bring along um, with us in the harvest, but also to look at ourselves and say, how do I know that I can do this? Or how do I, what do I need to be equipped to do this? And so um, there are three, character, three, uh, three characteristics. Or three things you need to receive. And so, that might be too low for everybody there. I might just write it in here. So a person of peace receives. First off, they receive the messenger. So we see in the story, when Jesus comes along, he asks her for some water and she's willing to engage with Christ in this conversation. So she receives him as the messenger. Not only that, she receives the message. Jesus offers her living water and she's willing to accept it. He tells her that he's the Messiah and she's even willing to accept that. So she receives the message. Not only that, we see that she receives the mission. 
And we talked about this last night with God's heart, God's heart, God's mission, his purpose for this earth is that all people um, would know him and worship him and, and have a relationship with him. And while we don't see a specific command uh, here in this passage from Christ to the woman, uh, if we look in the middle, Jesus even urges his disciples to be like this woman in uh, the middle part of 30. He tells them that the harvest is plentiful and that they should take part in the harvest. But she accepts the mission. She doesn't have a reservation to say, you know, I like this message, but I'm going to keep it for myself. No, she embraces the mission. She understands God's heart, and so it drives her to share with others. And so those are three characteristics we should be looking at ourselves for. First off, you know, have I received the messenger? Have I, have I received Christ? Have I received the teaching uh, of other believers? Right? Um, if, you, if you reject the messenger, you're probably going to reject the message. And then, have I received the gospel? Have I received the truth about Jesus Christ? Do I have a, a saving faith in him? And then third, have I received the mission? Have I accepted the mission? Um, and so we were talking about last night, you know, if you know what God's heart is, and that is agreeable to you, if you believe that really is what God wants for you, and you want to honor and serve God, then, then you want to be somebody who's receiving the mission and actually taking part in it. And so when we're out in the harvest, and we're out talking with neighbors and friends and family, we're going to find a lot of people who maybe accept the messenger. They might accept you, but they might have no desire for the message. Um, I have friends like that who are willing to hang out with me so long as I never bring out Jesus, right? Uh, and so I've had friendships end uh, because they want nothing to do with that. Um, and I've also had friends who were closed off to the message who eventually uh, became open to the message. But what I'm going to be looking for is somebody who accepts, who's willing to accept all three quickly, especially when I'm going into a new area um, and starting a group. Uh, and I've met many who accept the message and the message, but they don't want to follow in the mission. Right? They're, they're good to just know that they're saved and not bring it anywhere. Uh, but when we're looking for persons of peace, we're looking for people to bring to this. People who, as we were talking last night, who want to receive the tools so they can build on something. Who really want to embrace God's mission. We want people who are quickly wanting to embrace all these things. And this embracing doesn't mean that you have to feel like you're perfect at it at the moment, right? This, this woman, she didn't have any of the experience behind her or any of the education or tools or anything. But she was willing to start somewhere. And, and that's what we need to have, that kind of heart. We need to be willing to start somewhere. And the experience will come as you're doing it. The education will, will come as you're doing it. And it's not a requirement to get started. And it's not a requirement to have a theological degree to continue doing it, right? We can be faithful to share um, while we're going. Because so that's what we're going to be looking for. That's what we should be looking for when you're talking to your friends and family. Um, but now we're going to be kind of talking about how do we find these people of peace. And uh, this, is, so this is kind of how we kind of introduce with, with Go. Um, what are we looking Who are we looking for? And now we're going to be talking about how we can be looking for these people. So if everybody wants to turn with me to Luke 10, I'm going to go ahead at your tables. I'm going to have you read uh, verses 1 through 11, and I'm going to give everybody, let's say, five minutes. And as you're reading through it, I want you to take note of two things. Uh, one, what are things that Jesus tells the people in this passage to do, and what are things he tells them to don't to do, or to not do? Um, so... Let's spend, let's spend five minutes uh, reading through the passage and talking about what we see to do and not to do. And I'll get us back. All right. I hope everybody had enough time to get through most of it. Uh, if you didn't, you want something to write for you? That would be helpful. My writing is bad. Yeah, I am. <laughs> All right. So I hope everybody got a chance to read through everything. Um, if you didn't, that's okay. We're all here as a group. Uh, so if there's anything you missed, uh, we will pick it up as one as a group. Um, but we'll start with Jesus telling his disciples what he's going to do when they go into the villages. And so uh, we're going to start with what are some things he tells us to do so we can popcorn it. What are some things Jesus tells us to do in this passage? Or tells his disciples to do as he sends them out? Pray. Pray, yeah. Jesus, pray. pray. Is there anything specific to pray for? Pray for our neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, pray for labors. Go peacefully. Yeah, go peacefully. Go in pairs. Yeah, two by two. That's right. Why do you think he wanted them to go by two by twos? So that they support each other, build each other up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Jesus doesn't send them out alone, he sends them together so they have extra support with them. They have somebody who can push them to keep going. I know if I were to go out in the harvest alone, there would be a temptation to, to not actually be faithful in doing so. My nerves might get to me. When I have another brother or sister in Christ there with me who has the same mission that I do, then we can urge each other on. I'm a, I know one of my favorite things, I'm in Raleigh, 
going out with people is sometimes I won't have the courage to speak up to start, and then a brother will go, hey, you're going to get that guy, right? And then it's like, well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> so they push you on. Yeah. So you got, you got the support there. Um, and you also have accountability. Um, and so you can talk to and pray through these things. about. Um, what else do we see that we're to do? Yeah, heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom, right? So we're taking um, the good news of Christ that he's able to change hearts. And so as we're going out, we should proclaim, proclaim the kingdom. The kingdom is here. Christ died, rose again, and he's come to offer life. We should heal the, the sick. Um, and one of the ways that we can partake in that is one by healing spiritual sickness, by giving them the gospel, the antidote to all of our uh, all of the issues in our heart. Uh, but also to pray um, for their needs. Um, and if we have the means to help with those needs, we can provide them. What else do we see? Establish peace when entering the house. Yeah, yeah, proclaim peace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because he says proclaim the kingdom, he also says proclaim peace. Yeah. <coughs> eat what is set before you. Yeah, eat what is set before you. Why do you think he wants them to eat the food that's given to them? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, not offend anybody, but also I think that sometimes we have a temptation to not let people serve us when we're out serving. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how you're going to figure out who a person of peace is. Um, the person of peace receives you as the messenger, and so oftentimes the person of peace is going to want to serve you. Um, and so we ought to not um, be so um, geared on wanting to serve you to not let them actually be a person of peace to us. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people serve you. I had a temptation that as a, as a kid, when I'd go over to a friend's house, his parents would take me to like, the store and be like, do you want something like a snack? And I would refuse because I didn't want to inconvenience them. But I realized that I was actually not being loving to them because they wanted to show their love to me, and I wasn't letting them serve. Mm -hmm. um, so we want people who are willing and ready to not only not offend, but to let them serve us when they want to serve us. What else do we see? Anything else? Shake off the dust and move on. And yeah, yeah. If you're rejected, shake off the dust. Right. We don't have to carry the baggage um, of the rejection. Right. They're not ultimately rejecting us. They're re rejecting Christ, and that is that is hard. Um, it just tells us to, to wipe it off our feet and to. Move on and keep looking for people, right? Uh, that doesn't mean there's no hope for that person, right? Um, but when we're out in the harvest, we meet people who maybe aren't ready to, to receive that good news yet. And our goal is to find those who are and bring them along with us quickly um, and continue praying for those. We should shake off the dust of our feet. Anything else we're told to do in this passage? Feel the sick. I think we got up there. Yeah. Stay with the house of peace. Is that what somebody said? Yes, uh, stay, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so when you find somebody who's willing and receptive and open to the message of the gospel, or even um, so far as to the, even accept the, the gospel of Christ, you want to stay with, with that person. That doesn't mean that you never go on, but if God has given you somebody who's open and receptive to the message, there could be a temptation to say, well, I want to keep meeting other people, but if God has given you that person, you should be taking some time to try and equip and encourage them so they can then join you in the harvest and, and reach more people. Um, and so that's something that we got to keep. We got to make sure we're keeping in mind if we want to be staying with these people of peace and building them up because they're going to be the ones who are coming beside us, laboring in this work. Um, we don't want to be, as we saw in that example by Zach last night, we don't want to be doing it all ourselves. And so, staying with these people of peace and equipping them and encouraging them and, and growing them up so they can have confidence in their faith and to do exactly what the Samaritan woman did and what we will be doing and what we are doing as a as a church community. Um, staying with them is an important step because we want to make sure they're ready for those things. Anybody else find anything else? I don't have anything else, but if somebody else has another do. I'm kind of reading in between the lines here. It says, um, Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Mm -hmm. In other words, maybe know that you may be persecuted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That these people, they don't like you. Yeah. A lot of people are, don't like the message. Jesus said, If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They hated me, they'll hate you also. Yeah, maybe that would go on to be that. I think that's great. Yeah, be aware of persecution. I'd say even like maybe um, yeah, be aware of the situation that you're going into. I know a parallel passage to this. He says to his disciples, be gentle as doves and as clever as serpents. So we should go out to proclaim peace, but we should also know that not everybody there has our best interests at heart um, or God's best interests at heart. So we need to go out knowing that we really are in a world where there is wickedness. Um, we're there to bring light to that wickedness. So. Yeah. So we kind of put that as a don't. Like, don't. don't get discouraged if people don't receive you. Okay, yeah, we can put it over there. Yeah. <laughs> nice transition. Right. Yeah, there we go. Yes, thank you, Barbara, that helps. Yeah, so I guess we can move on to don'ts now. Um, 
don't get discouraged, right? And that's kind of even with the idea of shaking off the dust off your feet. We're not meant to hold on to these things and beat ourselves up when somebody rejects the message. Um, what else do we see don't to do? Don't get distracted. Yeah, don't get distracted. Don't, don't go house to house. Um, greet no one on the road. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I was going to ask where you see don't get distracted, but yeah. As in, like, um, stay focused, stay mm-hmm. minded. Yeah. Right. Yeah, not the strict view of it, which is if you see somebody you know when you're walking while outreach, you don't say, hey, leave me alone. Um, but we don't want to get distracted. Um, there's a temptation. We find somebody, maybe it's a fellow brother in Christ when we're out in that time in the harvest. We want to stop and talk to them because it's so nice to talk to them. But our mission is, well, if we're going out to share the gospel, our mission should be to find those um, who are not already with us, who are sharing. Um, so, yeah, if you have a goal in mind and you said, I've set this time aside for this purpose, we are not get distracted. But what else do we see don't want to do? Don't bring money. Yeah. Do you, what do you think that might be about? Is there a particular reason? Um, I guess trusting God will provide for us all the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, don't take provisions. Uh, or even, um, and then the positive of that would be to trust that the Lord would provide for you. Um, so the context of the disciples who send them out to go live in these villages and told them I was going to provide space for you so tell them not to bring provisions. Um, for us, we're going out the harvest maybe on campus. That doesn't mean that you have to leave your wallet behind. That means you don't need to come. Um, you don't need to be bringing anything else to the table. You need to trust the Lord. If the Lord said the harvest is plentiful, um, trust Him in that. Um, that you don't have to bring anything extra with you in order to accomplish that purpose. That, that He is enough and He'll provide both the persons of peace and also the, 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 the words and everything else that you need in order to accomplish that purpose. Do we see anything else um, not to do? You said don't move from house to house, but it kind mm-hmm. of coincides with stay with your house. Right, yeah. Yeah, I would say, because it definitely falls under don't get distracted, but I even put don't go house to house on my own as well. Um, just the, once you've found that person in peace, stay with them. Don't don't move on um, so quickly. But uh, yeah, so these are some things that you can apply when you go out and harvest. Um, and so if you've been around us for long or enough time, or if you haven't gone before, when we go out together, we'll be doing a lot of these things. We'll be going out twos, um, praying for people, proclaiming the good news, sharing our story, um, and um, trying to find those people at peace. And we find them, we stay with those people, and we get back up with them and continue training them. Um, so that's how we find a person at peace. Thank you, Maggie. I do not know who is up next. Um, oh, yeah, it is Barbara.